born into an age of barbarism. He changed the way wars were fought and pushed Rome to the brink of destruction. At Trebia, Trasimene, then the Battle of Canaan. This was the single bloodiest day in ancient warfare. In fact, possibly the single bloodiest day ever in warfare. His name struck fear in the heart of every Roman. Yet much of his life remains a mystery. Is he an honorable man? Is he a horrible man? The real Hannibal is somewhere lost in these images. Military genius, monster, legend. Now, the true story of Hannibal. In 202 BC, two men met on the arid plains of North Africa. There, the Carthaginian general Hannibal and the Roman consul Scipio discussed prospects for peace and the fortunes of a war that had dragged on far too long. In 16 years of fighting, they'd lost fathers, brothers, uncles, and friends. Unable to reach an accord, Hannibal and Scipio parted ways. The next day, the armies of Carthage and Rome would clash in a battle as decisive as it was fierce. Out of that battle, one nation would embark upon the path to empire, the other to total destruction. For nearly two decades, Rome had been powerless to stop Hannibal's march across Italy. During that time, he'd won victory after victory, killing more than 100,000 Roman soldiers. His exploits have been immortalized in the writings of the ancient historians Polybius and Livy. But little is known of the man himself. Was he a liberator, a barbarian, or both? When it comes to Hannibal, we don't know nearly as much as we'd like to. The real Hannibal who seems to have been a man of great ability, of great ability to win the loyalty of people around him, a man who had a very clear plan for how he was going to fight the war, is perhaps neither the monster nor is he the hero. He was not afraid or unwilling to commit atrocities, and on the other hand, he was also willing to show honor and respect to those he defeated. Hannibal's homeland, Carthage, was the heart of the Punic Empire. Residing upon the windswept shores of the western Mediterranean, the Carthaginians had dominated sea trade in that part of the world for centuries. The picture that often comes down to us is that of a fairly ruthless trading society, one bent on getting a profit at any cost and one that doesn't have the same kind of, of outlook towards their divinities that the Greeks and the Romans had. We have very little in the way of the Carthaginian viewpoint. Most of what we have comes from a Roman perspective or a Greek perspective. Long before Hannibal's time, Rome and Carthage were already bitter enemies. In 264 BC, the two empires went to war for control of the Mediterranean and the strategically important island of Sicily. The First Punic War lasts for over 20 years. It's fought predominantly around Sicily. Some of it on land, but the big decisive encounters of this war are massive naval actions fought off the shores of Sicily. And in the end, it's the Carthaginians who give out and surrender. Both sides are nearly exhausted, but the Romans have just got that little bit extra willpower. After 23 years of war, Rome finally achieved a decisive victory over Carthage at sea and took advantage of the situation to impose humiliating terms upon its rival. Carthage was forced to dismantle most of its navy forfeit all claims to Sicily and pay a huge indemnity to the Romans. What really rubs salt into the wounds for the Carthaginians is the way the Romans treat them afterwards. 
Because in all their dealings with Carthage, the Romans make absolutely clear that Carthage is not Rome's equal. As far as the Romans are concerned, you no longer have any rights. Carthaginian general Hamilcar Barca returned from the First Punic War to his family and his impressionable six-year-old son, Hannibal. During the 20-year conflict, Hamilcar had never been defeated by the Romans, but had only surrendered as a result of the treaty made at home. Hamilcar longed for another chance to fight the Romans. Hamilcar Barca, in many ways, is the bridge between the First Punic War and the Second. He's one of the Carthaginian generals in the First War with Rome, I and mean, then at the end of it, He's absolutely convinced he hasn't lost at all. You know, it's just the Carthaginian government that hasn't supported him properly and that has given in rather cravenly to the Romans instead of allowing him to keep on the fight. So he comes back rather disillusioned. He felt the Carthage should not have lost that first war with Rome. He was undefeated. And so he was looking, I think, from a very early moment for a way to get back at Rome to rebuild Carthaginian power. Hamilcar's thoughts of revenge were interrupted when Carthage found itself facing a mutiny at the hands of its own army. Unlike the Greeks and Romans, the Carthaginians did not use their own citizens to fight in their army. Instead, they hired mercenaries from all over the Mediterranean. Hamilcar himself had commanded 20,000 of these professional soldiers while fighting in Sicily during the First Punic War. After the war ends in 241, he sends them back to North Africa. And he had made numerous problems during the course of the campaign uh, about the money that they would get after it was over, uh, the other benefits that they would win. Uh, but now once they get back to North Africa, the Carthaginian government unwisely decides uh, to try to lowball them by giving them less money than they had previously been promised. The mutinous army laid siege to Carthage and blockaded its port. Hamilcar must now crush the very men he commanded in Sicily. Hamilcar was quite ruthless towards them, and the story goes that when he captured any of them, he either put them to the sword at once, or he bound them and flung them under his elephants to be trampled to death. And that was meant to be a warning to everybody else. Rome did not sit idly by while Hamilcar put down the rebellion. In 238 BC, they seized Corsica and Sardinia, islands that had been Carthaginian strongholds for centuries. When the Romans took Sardinia from the Carthaginians in 237, they claimed they did so because the Carthaginians had attacked merchants sailing between Rome and Sardinia, and they used that as an excuse. It was a classic Roman maneuver to claim that a wrong had been done to them and therefore they were avenging it by taking over Sardinia. The Carthaginians, of course, looked upon this as an absolute outrage. After the Roman takeover of Sardinia and Corsica, Hamilcar went to Spain to rebuild Carthaginian power. If Carthage was ever to be able to take on Rome, it would need a new source of manpower, and that source of manpower was Spain. Carthage had long established colonies there, and Hamilcar went there to make those stronger and to be able to create a military base. According to the Roman historian Livy, it was at that moment that Hannibal stepped onto the pages of history. Hamilcar was about to carry his troops over into Spain when Hannibal, then about nine years old, begged to be allowed to accompany him. Whereupon Hamilcar, who was preparing to offer sacrifice for a successful outcome, led the boy to the altar and made him solemnly swear with his hand upon the sacred victim that as soon as he was old enough, he would be the enemy of the Roman people. In all the years that followed, Hannibal would never betray that childhood oath. Those words uttered in the temple of Baal would one day strike fear in the hearts of every Roman. In 237 BC, Hamilcar Barca set out to rebuild the finances and army of war-torn Carthage. 
the Romans had cut off their old sources of manpower and money. Now the Carthaginian general looked west to Spain. Spain had wealth. Spain had mines, gold and silver mines. Spain also had manpower, manpower that had proven itself in terms of military skill and zest, I guess, for warfare as well. Carthaginian control in Spain was a mixture of diplomatic and military activity. Carthaginians preferred to build up a system of alliances whereby local chiefs would contribute troops to the Carthaginian army. Uh, if people were found to be uncooperative, then military force would be used. Hamilcar Barca, whose surname meant lightning, descended upon Spain like a force of nature. The Greek historian Polybius later wrote of Hamilcar's exploits. He had once crossed the straits by the Pillars of Hercules and proceeded to establish the power of Carthage over the peoples of Iberia. He spent nearly nine years in the country, during which time he brought many tribes under Carthaginian sway. Accompanying Hamilcar was an army of several thousand men and his three sons, Hannibal, Hasdrubal, and Mago. The young boys were nicknamed the Lion's Brood. Like their father, they too would be warriors. He raises his sons almost to be generals against Rome. It's not just that they'll be great servants of Carthage. The aim is very much restoring the balance of power after the First Punic War, of humiliating Rome just the way that the Romans had humiliated Carthage. So Hannibal grows up with Hamilcar's army. And certainly as soon as he's into his mid-teens, he appears to be getting more and more direct experience of warfare. He was raised, really, to be a soldier, to be a leader. In the winter of 229 BC, Hannibal and his brothers joined Hamilcar in laying siege to the town of Helicae. It would prove to be a fatal error. During the fighting, a local Spanish chieftain and his army arrived under the guise of allying themselves with the Carthaginians. But at an opportune moment, the Spaniards ambushed Hamilcar and his troops. The general sent his son safely off in one direction while he led his attackers in another. found himself caught between the enemy and a rain-swollen river. With no chance for escape, Hamilcar plunged himself and his horse into the rapids. Thus ended the life of Hamilcar Barca. Within five years of his father's death, Hannibal was named supreme military commander of Carthage. In the words of the historian Livy, the troops received him with unanimous enthusiasm. The old soldiers feeling that in the person of this young man, Hamilcar himself was restored to them. In the features and expression of the son's face, they saw the father once again. The same vigor in his look, the same fire in his eyes. In this picture, Hannibal reminds the men of his father he's very active he's first into battle and last out of battle he lives the same life as his men he puts on no airs and he is able to show that he has all the makings of a leader the army acclaim him as general and then the civilian authorities in Carthage far away accept this appointment. It makes for an incredibly high level of esprit de corps. It's an army which has been together for a very, very long time, led by a fellow soldier, rather than somebody who's appointed from a city far, far away that none of them have ever even seen. In many ways, he's a truly multinational leader. He's more Spanish than he is Carthaginian. He's got very strong connections with all the different nationalities in his army. But at the same time, he seems to never forget the fact that he is a Carthaginian. The years following Hamilcar's death proved fruitful for the Barkids as they founded the city of New Carthage, 
minted coins bearing their own likenesses and added thousands of loyal new soldiers to their army. Spain itself is going to be useful as a base, but it's even more important as a source of military manpower and of the wealth to support that army. You can get the money that you need to pay your soldiers. You can get the grain that you'll need to feed them. And you've got a land base that, as will ultimately be shown, allows you to reach Italy and threaten the Romans in their own heartland. The Romans were uncomfortable with this and sent embassies to find out what was going on. Eventually, they signed a treaty. The treaty said the River Ebro would become the northernmost limit of Carthaginian interest in Spain, and the Romans would not be interested in going south of that. Hannibal seized more and more Spanish territory for Carthage, but did not take his army north of the River Ebro. Yet when he returned from an expedition in the autumn of 220 BC, he found two Roman envoys awaiting. The Romans warned Hannibal against attacking the coastal town of Saguntum, claiming the city and its inhabitants were allies of Rome. The Romans always liked to believe that they fought wars that were just. And a just war, the best way it could be justified, was when an enemy had attacked either yourself or one of your allies. So there are some fairly shady occasions when the Romans will ally with a people they're expecting to be attacked by someone they want to fight. Enraged by the Romans' demands, Hannibal laid siege to Saguntum. It's quite a brutal affair. Whilst this is happening, the Romans send an embassy to him to tell him to stop. Saguntum is allied to Rome, therefore, if you attack Saguntum, you're attacking us, and we'll know what to do about it. Hannibal ignores them. He could have laid off the Saguntines. Uh, he knew perfectly well what the consequences would be. In this case, the leader of the Roman embassy, who's a chap called Fabius Buteo, gives the Carthaginian Senate a clear choice. He's demanded that they've either got to condemn Hannibal and arrest him, hand him over to the Romans for punishment for this act of war against the Roman state, or they've got an alternative, they'll have to go to war with Rome. So Fabius stands up in the Carthaginian Senate and he says that within the fold of my toga, I can give you either peace or war. And at this point, the Carthaginian Senate says, bellow out, then we'll have war, and Fabius says, so be it. This is how this major conflict that's going to tear the Mediterranean world apart begins. Hannibal now had what he wanted. War with Rome. When Rome declared war on Carthage in 218 BC, there was little doubt in the heart of the powerful city-state as to who would win a second Punic War. Just two decades earlier, the Romans had crushed Carthage. While Hannibal's countrymen had recovered much of the strength lost at the end of the First Punic War, they were still no match for the even greater power of Rome. The Romans now dominated the Western Mediterranean and, if necessary, could raise an army larger than any the world had ever seen. The Romans have at their disposal manpower that's estimated by Polybius as well over 700,000 adult males that they can call out to fight in their army. If one of their armies gets beaten, even if it gets destroyed, the Romans can form another one. That's not true of most of the other powers of the ancient world. The men who led the Roman army into battle were known as consuls. Each year in Rome, there were two consuls elected, and these were, to some extent, the co-presidents of the Roman state during their year in office. But the consuls had equal authority. Neither one could overrule the other. Publius Cornelius Scipio and Tiberius Sempronius Longus were elected consuls for the year 218 BC. Both were confident that Carthage and its young leader Hannibal posed no real threat to Rome. The Romans in 218 planned to behave as Romans always did. They had two armies, two consuls. One consul would go to fight Hannibal in Spain, would beat the man who'd started the war. 
The other consul would go to Sicily and from there launch an invasion of North Africa, go to Carthage itself, and would fight and destroy the Carthaginian Senate that had approved Hannibal's action and allowed the war to begin. So the Romans think very directly. They go straight for the jugular from the beginning. What rather surprised them was that in this case, so does Hannibal. Hannibal did not fear the Romans. The young general's confidence was bolstered by a massive war chest and an army of 100,000 men who would gladly die for the brilliant young commander. Well, they know each other, they trust each other. This is a tough, integrated fighting unit. Hannibal leads in a very charismatic fashion. It looks as though he's almost like a king in this army. One very important difference about the Carthaginian army under Hannibal and the Roman army, at least at the beginning of the Second Punic War, was the fact that Hannibal's soldiers spent all of their time training for war or all of their time fighting. They were professional soldiers. Rome's soldiers are citizen soldiers. They are amateurs, essentially. And this is going to give Hannibal's men a huge advantage. Another key component of Hannibal's army were 37 African elephants. Carthage had borrowed the idea of elephants as weapons from Alexander the Great. They're almost like tanks. To people who've never seen an elephant before, having one elephant or a dozen elephants or more bearing down on you is a terrifying sight. This thing is massive. It's bigger than anything you've seen before. It's coming straight at you. It's trumpeting. It's strange. It's noisy. It's huge. It's threatening. It's got these great tusks on it. It's a terrifying thing. And in some cases, armies that had never been tested by elephants before and had never seen them before would simply flee at the sheer sight of them and run away. A superior army and a herd of elephants, however, would not be enough to defeat Rome, the greatest power in the Mediterranean. Victory would require a battle plan both bold and brilliant. Hannibal would take the fight right to the heart of Rome. That means that he's got a problem. He's got to get his army from Spain to Italy so that he can actually fight this war with the hope of winning it rather than simply staving off defeat. With the Carthaginian navy in ruins after the First Punic War and no naval bases in the Mediterranean, invading Italy by sea was no longer an option which means he's got to think about it the other way around, which is going by land. That means he's got to launch a major expedition, carry out this mammoth march before he actually arrives in Italy. So it's a massive task, and it's something that did rather surprise the Romans. In the spring of 218 BC, Hannibal set out for Italy with 100,000 men and 37 elephants. Ahead lie 1,000 miles of rain-swollen rivers, mountain ranges, and warring tribes. Meanwhile, the Roman consuls Publius Scipio and Sempronius Longus had departed for Spain and North Africa to mount an invasion. En route to Spain, Scipio docked at the Rhone. There, he received word from his scouts that Hannibal's army had entered southern France. Scipio waited at the mouth of the Rhone in the mistaken belief that Hannibal was coming to fight him. Instead, Hannibal slipped past the Romans and continued his march north to Italy. And this is crucial. Had Scipio been able to block Hannibal there or somehow trap him in Spain, the history of the war might have been completely different. Hannibal narrowly avoided the Romans en route to the French Alps, but he faced one more hurdle, transporting his elephants across the Rhone. What they have to do is build essentially a bridge and cover it on the side so the elephants can't see too much of the water uh, on either side. And then also they send the female elephants across first. And apparently when the males see the females go first, then they're willing to go across. And then they kind of ship them across one by one. lay between Hannibal and Italy, the perilous French Alps. Hannibal's big problem is getting himself to Italy before the year ends. He ends up crossing the Alps in November. Cold weather had already set in, and you're bringing these elephants, these huge animals, across these very difficult mountain tracks. And this seems to have a hold on the imagination because almost everybody who's heard anything about Hannibal, the first thing they talk about is the elephants in the Alps. 
The imposing sight of the mountain struck fear in the hearts of Hannibal's troops, prompting a fiery speech from the leader. Year after year, you have fought with me and won. When finally you have the Alps in sight and know that the other side of them is Italian soil, you come to a halt, exhausted. Either confess then that you have less spirit and courage than a people you have again and again defeated during these latter days, or steel your hearts to march forward, to halt only on Mars' field between the Tiber and the walls of Rome. For two weeks, Hannibal and his men battled snowstorms and freezing temperatures. As their ascent continued, the losses mounted. Some ancient sources say Hannibal lost as many as 50,000 men between Spain and Italy. Still, Hannibal urged his troops onward. My men, you are at this moment passing the protective walls of Italy. Nay, more, you are walking over the very walls of Rome. Henceforward, all will be easy going. No more hills to climb. After a fight or two, you will have the capital of Italy, the citadel of Rome, in the hollow of your hands. After four months in northern Spain and 15 days in the French Alps, the Carthaginian army finally reached the Po Valley in northern Italy. The abiding image of Hannibal's crossing of the Alps is of Hannibal sitting on an elephant, perhaps on top of a mountain, looking down at Italy before him. And I think that was part of Hannibal's idea. When the Gallic tribes of northern Italy saw these elephants among them, they knew that Hannibal must be a man of incredible capacity. So Hannibal's got his toughest troops, his most important forces, to Italy with him. A commander who was less talented, less determined, less charismatic probably wouldn't have got his army there at all. Certainly in a state where it can take on the Romans and fight them. Word of Hannibal's arrival would soon reach the consul Scipio. War was at Rome's doorstep. Roman consuls Publius Cornelius Scipio and Tiberius Sempronius Longus departed Rome in 218 BC. They were seeking more than victory on the distant battlefields of Spain and North Africa. They were seeking personal glory. You want to be able to go back, put up all the mementos of your triumph on your house. Best of all, you really want to win the right to celebrate a triumph, where you'll have this great formal procession through the city of Rome. You'll be dressed up like the statues of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, Rome's oldest gods. They paint your face terracotta red, so you look like the terracotta statues of the god. And you parade right through the center of Rome with the captives you've taken, the spoils of your battle. Everybody tells you how wonderful you are. In a sense, you're almost Jupiter for that day, and you're treated as such. Consuls are one to win success. So it does mean that Roman high commanders are often rather desperate to make sure that the campaign comes to a conclusion quickly. And it does mean that they're very bold, very reckless. Ironically, when the Romans went to war against Carthage in 218 BC, their first mistake was in granting Hannibal too much time to launch his battle plan. They thought they had plenty of time. They thought Hannibal was not that much chop and would, could be dealt with when they felt they had the time for him. They were in, of course, for a nasty surprise. Against long odds, Hannibal reached Italy. But during the arduous march, he'd lost tens of thousands of men and many of his elephants. In desperate need of new troops, he turned to the Gauls of the Po Valley. Now, Hannibal has already contacted many of the leaders of these Gallic tribes with a view to allying with them as soon as he gets to Italy. Also known as Celts, the Gauls excelled in hand-to-hand -hand combat, favoring a double-edged long sword. Their reputation was one of ferocious and fearsome warriors. Polybius tells us they even go into battle naked, you know, screaming in their languages, terrified the poor little Romans. They hated the Romans. The Romans had defeated them in battle only 
seven, eight years earlier. Hannibal was playing on the Celtic desire for revenge. And all of a sudden, Rome is finding her two most dangerous enemies joining forces against her. It's very clear that the Second Punic War is going to be a life or death struggle for Rome. Hannibal had a master strategy. He would win Gallic tribes and Roman allies over to his side by defeating the Romans in battle after battle. With its sources of manpower depleted, Rome would have little choice but to surrender to Carthage. Hannibal himself presented his invasion of Italy as a war of liberation. We know of many times in which he talked to the Italian allies of Rome and told them that he was there to free them from Roman oppression, that they could become the leaders of Italy, that they could become independent once again from the Roman menace. By December 218 BC, Hannibal had added 20,000 men to his army, giving him 46,000 troops. Their ability to fight together would soon be put to the test. When the Roman general Scipio learned that Hannibal had crossed the Alps and was already laying siege to Italian cities, he was astounded, but unimpressed. I want to find out if during these last 20 years, the earth has suddenly produced a new race of Carthaginians, or if they are still like those whom you ransomed at Eryx for 18 denarii a head. I want to know if this man Hannibal can substantiate his claim to be the rival of Hercules, or if he has just been left by his father as a tax-paying underling or even as a slave of the Roman people. With those words, Scipio set out to teach the young Carthaginian general a lesson. The first clash between the armies of Rome and Carthage took place at the Battle of Tychinus. On the eve of the battle, Hannibal addressed his troops. There is not one of you who has not with his own eyes seen me strike a blow in battle. I have watched and witnessed your valor in the field and your acts of courage I know by heart. I was your pupil before I was your commander. You must be brave. For you, there is no middle way between victory and death. Should fortune hesitate to favor you, meet death in battle rather than in flight. God has given man no sharper spur to victory than contempt of death. With Hannibal's words still ringing in their ears, the Carthaginian cavalry rode out to meet the Romans. is Hannibal and 6,000 of his cavalrymen meeting up with Publius Cornelius Scipio, uh, his cavalry, which was much less numerous and not as effective, and some of his lightly armed troops. Now Scipio jumps into this battle, expecting it to be relatively easy. Armed with little more than small shields and light spears, Hannibal's Numidian cavalry wrought havoc upon their less experienced foe. Eventually, the Roman cavalrymen broke and fled. Only a few remained behind to fight with Scipio. The Roman general was gravely wounded in the fighting and would have perished on the battlefield had it not been for the courage of his 17-year-old son, Scipio the Younger. He sees his father wounded in the battle. He charges out alone at first, you know, to go rescue his, his father. Uh, supposedly, he shamed the other cavalrymen into joining him, to helping him rescue his father. He's able to pull him out of the fight. The younger Scipio would not forget what he had witnessed at Tychinus. But there was little time to linger on his father's defeat. Only a month later, the Romans would engage Hannibal again at Trebia, the first major battle of the Second Punic War. With Scipio seriously wounded, the task of stopping Hannibal fell to the other consul, Sempronius Longus. Reputed by some historians to have been arrogant and stubborn, Longus planned to take the fight directly to Hannibal. On a cold, snowy day in December of 218 BC, Longus would have his chance. The Battle of Trebia is the first time that he comes up against an entire Roman army. So you have, on the Roman side, a chap called Sempronius Longus, who 
has only got a couple of months left of his term of office as consul, so he really wants to fight a battle. If he can get the glory of having beaten Hannibal, ending this war, that'll be a terrific achievement for the end of his 12 months of office. So he wants to get this over with before a successor arrives and takes all the credit. Hannibal, too, was spoiling for war. He needed a dramatic victory to win the remaining Gallic tribes over to his side. So Hannibal wants a battle, Sempronius Longus wants a battle. But Hannibal goes about this in a much more sophisticated way than his Roman opponent. Hannibal is the one who selects the battleground, the battlefield where this will actually take place. And he lures Sempronius Longus' army onto this field. And what Hannibal does to entice these guys into battle is use his Numidian cavalry to hit the Romans and then at the same time try to keep out of, of reach of the Romans and drag them forward. Sempronius believes that because these Numidians seemingly are retreating, he therefore moves over to the attack and takes the bait and follows right to the battlefield where, of course, Hannibal wants the battle to take place. So the Romans have rushed into a battle. Hannibal has expected this. His men have eaten, they are prepared. He's also been even more careful than that, in that the night before, having known the ground he wanted to lure Longus and his army onto, Hannibal has selected 2,000 of his best troops under his younger brother Mago's command, and he's hidden them in a drainage ditch that will be in a position that will effectively be behind the Roman front line once the Romans deploy where Hannibal wants them to. Now, when the battle takes place, uh, to a large extent, it goes exactly the way Hannibal drew it up on the chalkboard. Uh, his center is able to hold the Romans at least for a uh, long enough time so that his wings can come around and hit the Romans from the sides. Just as they had at Tychinus, the Numidians quickly outflanked the Roman cavalry and routed them. The Roman cavalry are chased off the battlefield. Many of them are killed. The Roman flanks also come under huge pressure, quite possibly helped by the presence of Hannibal's elephants that the Romans aren't used to dealing with. The Carthaginian infantry and cavalry proved a devastating combination. Trained to fight other infantry, Roman legionaries were incapable of withstanding Hannibal's skillful deployment of different types of soldiers. Once the wings of the Roman cavalry collapsed, Hannibal was poised to deliver the death blow. By this time, Mago and his force of 2,000 men behind the Roman line have come up out of hiding, have attacked unexpectedly from the rear. So there's absolute confusion in the rear Roman lines. The wings are folding, the wings are collapsing. It's only in the center where they've had this small success. So the Roman legions punch through and break through, but as soon as they get a little bit beyond Hannibal's line, they look back and see that the rest of their army is being destroyed. Longus lost two-thirds of his army at Trebia. His term as consul had ended in failure. The Roman response to defeat would be to turn out an even bigger army, setting the stage for bloodshed unlike any the world had ever witnessed. victories at Tachinus and Trebia in 218 BC. Hannibal and his army departed the Po Valley and marched south to the region of Etruria. If the Carthaginians were to defeat Rome, they would need more victories, but most of all, more allies. Now, so far, this has worked fairly well. He's won the two battles in northern Italy. He's able to get many of these Gallic tribes to come over to him to actually join his army. That's important. But nobody south of the Apennine Mountains, of course, has defected at this point. The journey proved difficult. Hannibal's troops spent three days wading through the marshes around the river Arno, and all but one of his elephants perished. Hannibal himself contracted an infection and lost sight in one eye. Despite these hardships, the Carthaginians reached Etruria in the spring of 217 BC. Meanwhile in Rome, Gnaeus Servilius Geminus and Gaius Flaminius were elected consuls. After Rome's two humiliating defeats at the hands of Hannibal, the new consuls were determined to crush him. They simply made a bigger effort for the following year 
with the idea that they would have the two consuls again with two armies, but this time the armies would operate fairly independently with the idea that they'd catch Hannibal in between at some point. It was the army of Flaminius that Hannibal's scouts discovered encamped nearby at Aradium. Reconnaissance was huge in the Second Punic War, especially early on, only Hannibal seems to have an effective force of spies. Now what happens is, Hannibal is able to get past Caius Flaminius. After Hannibal bypasses him, of course Caius Flaminius knows he's on Hannibal's trail, but he doesn't have any clear idea where Hannibal is. Now you don't have to go to West Point to know it's a pretty good idea to know where your enemy is at all times. And this gave Hannibal a huge advantage. With Flaminius in reckless pursuit, Hannibal's plan was working to perfection. Once again, he would lure the Romans onto a battlefield of his choosing, the shores of Lake Trasimene. Hannibal decides that this is the place where he is going to set his trap for Flaminius. The Carthaginians encamped along the northeastern edge of the lake. Unbeknownst to the Romans, sometime during the night, Hannibal covertly moved most of his forces into the hills above the lake's north shore. The following morning, the hills were shrouded in mist, and the Roman troops approached the lake. All they can see is a force of Carthaginians on the far side of the lake. The Romans think the Carthaginians are trying to escape from the Roman forces. So the Romans speed up and start to move after them. This is all exactly what Hannibal wants, for the Romans to think that his unit of troops on the far side of the lake is in fact the tail end of a retreating Carthaginian army. It's nothing of the sort. It's only one small part of an army, most of which is hidden in the hilltops around the lake. A huge roar goes up as the troops on the hilltops charge down at the Romans, yelling and screaming as they go. The Romans have no idea what hits them. These troops are appearing from nowhere. It's the biggest ambush in the history of ancient warfare. Lots of the Romans don't have the weapons to hand. Um, the ones who have aren't prepared to fight. They're not in any kind of fighting formation. And they can't see properly either. Um, the Carthaginians have an advantage. They're just going downhill. They know which way to go. Anybody in front of them is probably an enemy. The Romans can't tell that. As they're being picked up at a screaming mass of barbarians yelling in a dozen tongues, firing javelins and stones from above, attacking them with swords and spears at their sides, and the Romans are terrified. They're pushed into the lake. Lots of them think it's safer to get into the lake than to stand and fight. This is a disastrous error. They're wearing chainmail. Thousands of Romans must have drowned in the lake in a desperate attempt to get away. It was, without a doubt, one of the most nightmarish days in Roman history. When the mist over Lake Trasimene lifted, 15,000 Romans were dead, including the consul Flaminius. 2,500 Carthaginians had also perished in the fighting. Massive funeral pyres burned well into the night. When the news of the Battle of Lake Trasimene finally makes itself to Rome, Supposedly, one of the praetors, who was a city official, got up on the rostra, which is the big stage uh, in the forum, the center or heart of the city, and he tells the people, very short and to the point, we have been defeated in a great battle. After the big disaster at Lake Trasimene in 217 BC, one of the Roman consuls is dead. Another one is on the other side of Italy, and Hannibal's army is nearer to Rome than he is. So the Romans have a problem. They've got a vacuum of power. And they resort to the one institution that violates this principle of the Republic that no one man should ever have overwhelming power. Because they appoint what the Romans call the dictator. The man chosen by the Roman Senate to serve the six-month term as dictator was Quintus Fabius Maximus. 
Quintus Fabius Maximus was the traditional Roman aristocrat. He represented uh, all the sort of traditions of Roman honor, Roman dignity, uh, and a good deal of Roman caution as well. He believed that Hannibal's army was superior, and that what the Romans must do to avoid getting beaten was to avoid battle altogether. So what he proposed to do was basically follow Hannibal around and deny him uh, supplies, do anything he can to hamper Hannibal's efforts, but in no circumstances is he going to face Hannibal in battle and hand Hannibal another big victory. Now, these Fabian tactics were successful in the sense that he did not lose any big battles, but they also caused the Romans great uh, and extreme grief because, of course, Hannibal this entire time is burning Roman territory, destroying Roman property, uh, killing some Romans, and obviously the people want action. At the end of Fabius' six-month reign as dictator, the Romans elected two new consuls and decided to call up an army of twice the usual size. In doing so, they were choosing to renew the war with Hannibal. Soon, the victories at Tychinus, Trebia, and Trasimene would be eclipsed on a battlefield in southern Italy known as Cannae. victory over the Romans at Lake Trasimene, the Carthaginian army roamed the Italian countryside unchecked. Village after village fell prey to the Punic invaders as they made their way southward. After a string of defeats, the Romans had chosen to avoid a pitched battle with Hannibal. The Republic could ill afford another devastating loss. Instead, they waged a war of attrition, hoping to deny Hannibal's army food and supplies. By June of 216 BC, Hannibal's capture of the all-important supply depot of Cannae brought about a dramatic shift in Roman strategy. The Romans would no longer seek to avoid Hannibal, they would destroy him. Drawing on Rome's tremendous manpower, the Senate mustered an army of 88,000 men. It was very clear that the Roman people had decided that this was the year the war should be brought to an end. You do not raise an army that large unless you intend to use it, and to use it quickly. You cannot supply that number of people in the field. They have got to go out and seek decisive battle. Late July, the massive army set out for Canaan. As he had at Tychinus, Hannibal would face the combined armies of both consuls, Lucius Aemilius Paulus and Gaius Terentius Varro. Now, under most circumstances, the two consuls would go off and each lead an army and go off and fight in different theaters of operations. It's only when the enemy is really powerful, really threatening, that you send both consuls to the area. When you do that, the two consuls have equal authority, which means normally they come to an arrangement so that one holds office on one day and then his colleague takes over for the next day. So on alternate days, each consul will have power. Now, in a campaign, that can obviously give Roman strategy, Roman planning, a rather sort of spasmodic effect in that you've got two individuals, perhaps with different ideas, maybe conflicting ideas, who are controlling the army's fate. Varro supposedly wanted to fight a battle against Hannibal, whereas Paulus wanted to avoid battle unless it was under extremely favorable circumstances. When Roman forces arrived at Cannae in late July, the circumstances appeared to favor them. They outnumbered Hannibal's army of 45,000 men by nearly two to one. Encamped on a hillside overlooking the Alphidius River, Hannibal showed little concern for the Roman army laid out before him. And one of his officers, a chap called Gizgo, is supposed to look at these and comment on just how many of them there were. Hannibal is said to have said, well, yes, you've noticed that, Gizgo, but of course, amongst all those men, there's not a one called Gizgo just implying that somehow the Carthaginians were special, that 
didn't matter how many Romans there were, we're just better. Hannibal's confidence was not misplaced, a fact underscored by a Roman description of his army. To look at them, one might have thought the Africans were Roman soldiers. Their arms were largely Roman, having been part of the spoils at Trasimene and some too at the Trevia. The Gallic and Spanish contingents carried shields of similar shape, but their swords were of different pattern. Those of the Gauls being very long, those of the Spaniards being handily short and sharply pointed. One must admit, too, that the rest of the turnout of these people, combined with their general appearance and great stature, made an awesome spectacle. On the morning of August 1st, Hannibal led his multinational force onto the battlefield at Cannae. The cautious Roman consul Paulus surveyed his enemy's position and decided not to fight. It's a wise move, and it's quite acceptable. Challenges to battle are frequently turned down in the ancient world. They're only turned down, however, when the opposing army has clearly taken a superior position. Um, Hannibal had chosen his ground incredibly well, and for the Romans to have faced him would have meant certain defeat. The following morning, however, it's a different matter. Varro is now in command, and they decide to take the battle to the Carthaginians. It's gaining a psychological edge. We may not have been willing to fight you yesterday on your terrain, but we'll willingly fight you today on ours. Varro deployed his men along the banks of the Alphidius River. The Roman general hoped the rugged terrain would neutralize Hannibal's cavalry and prevent them from encircling his infantry. Under the relentless glare of the August sun, the Romans lined up in their standard formation. Given the strength and size of his enemy, Hannibal's success hinged entirely upon cunning and quickness. A head-on attack against the Romans would be suicidal. He's got a huge problem. The Roman legions are almost invincible in the frontal attack. They're relentless. Nothing will stop them. They'll just keep coming. And in his two previous victories, the Romans had punched through his center. Fortunately for Hannibal, he had a big advantage both in the number of cavalry uh, and in the quality of his cavalry. Now, what he does and what is different about this battle is he sets up his infantry in that crescent shape facing the Romans. So the crescent comes out towards the Roman lines. Hannibal rode amongst his men, barking last-minute orders and words of encouragement. A momentary silence engulfed the battlefield. All that stood between the two great armies was a cloud of red dust kicked up by the summer wind. The Romans approach in a very slow, methodical fashion. They're clashing their shields and spears together. The idea is to generate fear in the enemy. Suddenly, a hail of Roman spears rained down upon the front line of the Carthaginian army. The Roman center pushed forward an indomitable force. The Romans keep pushing, and the crescent becomes flatter and flatter, and then eventually turns inside out as the Romans are being pushed into the formation. The Gauls and the Spaniards are backpedaling very carefully, allowing the Romans to be sucked in. Because by being sucked in, the Romans are losing their formation. This is exactly what Hannibal wanted. On the left flank by the river, Hannibal's officer Hasdrubal led the Carthaginian cavalry to a quick victory against their Roman counterparts. Hasdrubal then raced his men behind the length of the Roman lines to confront the cavalry formed by Rome's Italian allies on the right wing. The Allied cavalry see them coming. They now see another fresh force of cavalry charging at them, and they break and flee, leaving the main body of Carthaginian cavalry to concentrate on the Roman infantry, which is now exposed. 
and then Hannibal springs his trap. The Romans are attacked at the sides by the Africans. They're still struggling with the Celts and the Spaniards at the front. And they're about to be attacked at the rear now by the Carthaginian cavalry. This is what's going to absolutely destroy them. They no longer have a sense of direction. The Romans are organized to fight going forward. All of a sudden, they're going to find themselves fighting on four fronts. They have no momentum and they're trapped. They don't know which way to go. What you have is the famous double envelopment of Cannae. The Roman army, though much more numerous than the Carthaginians, is now trapped uh, amongst these Carthaginian soldiers. The Romans can't see anything. They're surrounded in a haze of dust. There's nothing more terrifying to soldiers in battle than the feeling of impotence, the feeling that you're being attacked and cannot defend against it. The fighting continued for the rest of the day. When the dust cleared, 50,000 Romans lay dead. This was the single bloodiest day in ancient warfare. You've got a field which is probably two miles wide, maybe three miles deep, and covered in blood and corpses and screaming, moaning, dying men. In his epic history, the war with Hannibal, Livy described the battle's horrific aftermath. There lay those thousands upon thousands of Romans, foot and horse indiscriminately mingled. Here and there amidst the slain, there started up a gory figure whose wounds had begun to throb with the chill of dawn and was cut down by his enemies. Some were discovered lying there alive, with thighs and tendons slashed, bearing their necks and throats and bidding their conquerors drain the remnant of their blood. You've even got particularly strange things happening where Roman soldiers were found dead having dug holes in the ground and buried their heads in them apparently the notion being that they're so terrified of what's going on that they're trying to kill themselves in this peculiar fashion almost like an ostrich burying its head in the sand it's battle shock the Roman consul Paulus was among those killed in battle perishing under a shower of spears his co-consul, Varro, escaped with what remained of the cavalry. The younger Scipio, now an officer, also survived the battle. Just two years earlier, he'd rescued his father at Tychinus and fought in the Battle of Trivia. After witnessing the carnage of Cannae, he would be a sworn enemy of Hannibal for the rest of his life. The Roman would never forget the brutality or the brilliance of the Carthaginian commander. Hannibal's victory at Cannae is one of the supreme military achievements of all time. From a Roman point of view, they never suffer as heavily in any battle. You're talking about somewhere between 60 and 70,000 Romans are lost through being taken prisoner, through being killed in the battle, out of an army of almost 88,000 men. More Romans died in one day of fighting at Cannae than Americans died in combat in the entirety of the Vietnam War. That evening, Hannibal's cavalry officer, Maharbal, implored him to take advantage of the victory. Maharbal offered to take the cavalry and race ahead to attack the gates of Rome itself. But Hannibal, surveying his injured troops, decided against it, saying, I commend your zeal, but I need time to weigh the plan which you propose. Maharbal said in disgust, you know how to win a victory, Hannibal, but you don't know how to exploit it. And Livy adds, that day's delay is generally agreed to have been the salvation of the Empire of Rome. The Romans had put their best and biggest ever army up against the Carthaginians, and they had still lost, and they'd lost in a terrible fashion. By all the unwritten rules of warfare in this era, the Romans were defeated. They were expected to surrender. Confident of his success, Hannibal sent emissaries to Rome to offer terms for surrender and to collect ransom for his hostages. The Roman response would surprise him completely. just two years, the Romans had lost three major battles and more than 100,000 men at the hands of Hannibal. Following the Battle of Cannae, Hannibal's youngest brother, Mago, returned home 
where he offered Carthaginian leaders an impressive display of his brother's victories. Mago has these chests carried into the Carthaginian Senate. And they contain the rings that the Roman aristocracy wore. Mago has these things poured out in great mounds on the floor just to show how many Romans they've killed. Back in Italy, Hannibal fully expected the Romans to surrender. He dispatched an emissary and ten hostages to Rome to negotiate terms for peace. He didn't want to shatter Rome and destroy it altogether. What he wanted to do was a fairly standard thing, the way most people in the world thought of warfare. And that was fight to the point where one side admitted that it had been beaten and then accepted a treaty by which it conceded various things that the victor wanted. The Romans just did not think that way. Every Roman war was taken personally. The Romans not only refused to surrender, they forbade Roman citizens to pay ransom for their family members. They refused to accept that they have been defeated by all the acknowledged rules of war. It could be patriotism, it could be sheer bloody mindedness that they do this, but they carry on. Hannibal was probably shocked when his emissaries came back empty handed. His entire strategy was based on the notion that after a major victory on his part, the Romans would stop. Instead, the Romans raised a new army, 25 legions of 4,000 men each. At the same time, the Romans realized it had been a mistake to abandon the delaying tactics of Fabius. They again changed strategy and resumed their war of attrition. Hannibal needed victories in the battlefield if the Roman allies were to join him. The Romans simply refused to face him. They decided to pin him down. Quintus Fabius Maximus, known to the Romans as the Delayer, took command of the Roman armies. His strategy, which he'd used for a short period before Cannae, became effectively the official Roman policy. Hannibal wouldn't be fought. But changes in strategy weren't enough in the panic after Cannae. The Romans were convinced that they had lost the favor of their gods. They must make amends. The Romans sought to make things right with the universe by doing whatever it took to make things right with the gods again. Two Vestals were accused of unchastity, and it was thought that this had somehow added to the failure at Cannae. One of the Vestals was buried alive, as was the tradition for dealing with an unchaste virgin. The other one had conveniently committed suicide. In the wake of the loss of the Vestals, we have a very unusual ritual being performed by the Romans. The sacrifice of four people by being buried alive to reestablish a good relationship with the gods. Hannibal continued his rampage through southern Italy. Some towns fell to the sword, others simply changed their allegiance from Rome to Carthage. His biggest prize was Capua, the second largest city in Italy. Hannibal's grand plan to isolate Rome appeared to be working. By 212 BC, he controlled much of southern Italy. But not all Italians viewed the Carthaginians as liberators. Many saw them as murderous barbarians. Those steadfast allies refused to abandon their allegiance to Rome, fearing retribution if Hannibal were ever defeated. What Hannibal faced in the wake of his great victory at Cannae was the fact that his strategy was misconceived. Even though states in the south of Italy would begin to rebel against Rome, the core of Roman power in northern and central Italy would remain intact. He had simply not anticipated this. He had misunderstood what the relationship was between Rome and its allies. His allies were not going to desert, so no matter what he did in Italy, it would not be enough. Those Roman allies whom Hannibal had won over were now demanding he protect them from the wrath of the vengeful Roman. He would now be forced to fight a defensive war. All of these communities that have defected to Hannibal, supplied him with soldiers, then start crying out to Hannibal, it's because of you and because of what we've done, the Romans are coming for us. So Hannibal has to rush from one crisis to another. 
A critical turning point came in 211 BC when the Romans laid siege to Capua. Unable to lure the Romans into an open battle, Hannibal was powerless to break the siege. He responded with a breathtaking gamble. Hoping to draw the Romans away from Capua, he marched his army to the gates of Rome. The Greek historian Polybius later recounted the horror of that day. When the arrival of his army was reported, a wave of fear and panic swept through the city, for never before had Hannibal approached so close to the capital. The men, therefore, immediately manned the walls and occupied the commanding positions outside the city, while the women made the rounds of the temples and besought the gods to protect them, sweeping the pavements of the shrines with their hair, as is their custom at moments when extreme peril threatens the country. Hannibal's arrival at the gates caused great alarm, but it was five years too late. In the time since the Roman defeat at Cannae, the Republic had recovered both in spirit and strength, leaving Hannibal in a purgatory of sorts. The Roman army could not forcibly remove him from the outskirts of the city, yet he lacked the equipment and manpower to lay siege to Rome. In a show of disdain for Hannibal, the Roman Senate auctioned off the very land on which the Carthaginian army was camped, at full price. Hannibal retreated to the southeast. Over the next several years, the Carthaginians fought and won small skirmishes against the Romans, but only seized one port city on the opposite side of Italy from Spain. For all intents and purposes, Hannibal was cut off from his homeland and much needed reinforcements. Hannibal had become a chronic problem for the Romans, but a manageable one. Whilst the Romans don't beat him, successively over the years, they do pen him more and more tightly into an increasingly small corner of Italy. With Hannibal bogged down in Italy, the Romans expanded their battle against Carthage to new theaters throughout the Mediterranean. Through having these series of proxy wars, Spain, Sicily, Sardinia, Southern Gaul, Italy, Illyria, the war starts to look as though it's kind of a first world war. It's taking place everywhere in the Mediterranean. It will eventually take place in Africa as well. Hannibal's brother Hasdrubal fought the Romans in Spain, and his army was destroyed. With the Barkid stronghold now in the hands of the enemy, he assembled a small army and made his own crossing of the Alps. Hasdrubal arrived in northern Italy in early 207 BC and hoped to soon meet up with his brother. But the Roman army was waiting for him. Hasdrubal's force is very quickly cornered by far superior Roman forces and is simply destroyed. It's cut to pieces in a very short time. Now, Hannibal only finds out that his brother was in Italy at all when the Romans, having beheaded his brother, throw the severed head over the rampart of his camp in southern Italy. I think Hannibal was probably shocked by the treatment of his brother's corpse, but it must have brought it home to him that he had no hope of winning. There was no Carthaginian armies to come from Spain. There was certainly no Carthaginian army to come from Carthage. He had to win this war, or at least survive in this war, purely with the troops he then had. It was quite clear that wasn't going to be enough. In 204 BC, Hannibal received an urgent message from Carthage. His home city was under attack by the Romans. Hannibal departed Italy for North Africa to fight a battle that would decide the fate of Carthage and the entire Western world. By 206 BC, Rome finally found a commander who would be a worthy opponent to Hannibal, Publius Cornelius Scipio the Younger. No one understood the intricacies of Hannibal's tactics better than Scipio. The younger Scipio 
was present at the Battle of the Ticinus, obviously because he was there to save his father, and he possibly was also at the Battle of the Trebia River, so he saw Hannibal's tactics uh, in action there as well. And then, of course, he was at the Battle of Cana. So at least in three instances, Scipio had a very good look at what Hannibal was doing, and he obviously must have learned something from all this. A year after his father and uncle were killed leading the Roman armies in Spain in 211 BC, the 25-year-old Scipio was chosen to succeed them. The young general immediately set to work revamping the Roman army. Roman tactics prior to that have been very straightforward. They've been little more than attack, pause, allow fresh troops to replace the initial troops, and then attack again. Scipio's not doing that. Scipio's maneuvering very carefully. And you can actually trace this tactical development from Hannibal's father through Hannibal to Scipio himself. Over the next five years, while Hannibal was pinned down in southern Italy, Scipio conquered all of Spain for Rome. What Scipio had done was really to wage the war in Spain that Hannibal had hoped that he was going to wage in Italy. Scipio returned to Rome in 206 BC as a conquering hero. He was elected consul the next year and was granted rule over the island of Sicily. There, he was reunited with veterans he'd fought with at Cannae. After Cannae, the troops that had survived the battle and had escaped were seen as cowards. And the punishment for fleeing, the punishment for surviving the battle, was to be basically sent on active duty forever. They were sent to Sicily and there to stay for the duration of the war. When Scipio arrives in Sicily, he's ready to lead them to Africa in what will be an opportunity to have their revenge for the defeat of the hands of Hannibal over a dozen years earlier at Cannae. In the early summer of 204 BC, Scipio and an army of 17,000 men set sail for North Africa. Scipio lands and demonstrates just how much the Romans have learned since the beginning of the war, how much more effective they are as an army, and how much more skillful their commanders like Scipio are. Adding to the Carthaginians' worries, the Romans had allied themselves with the feared Numidian cavalry, who'd once been a key component of Hannibal's army. Scipio easily defeated the Carthaginian forces in North Africa. The Carthaginians were forced to petition for peace. At the same time, they sent a messenger to Hannibal, calling him back to defend his homeland. Seldom has any exile left his native land with so heavy a heart as Hannibal's, wrote the Roman historian Livy. Upon departing Italy, a tearful Hannibal was said to have railed against his political rivals in Carthage. For years past, they have been trying to force me back by refusing me reinforcements and money. But now, they recall me no longer by indirect means, but in plain words. At this unlovely and shameful return of mine, it will not be Scipio who will be wild with triumph and delight, but rather my political enemies, whose only way of ruining me and my house has been by ruining Carthage. Hannibal reached Carthage in 203 BC. He was accompanied by 15,000 of his veteran soldiers. Men Livy described as an army toughened by hardships almost beyond human endurance, drenched a thousand times with Roman blood, and carrying with it the spoils not of soldiers only, but of generals. About a third of the army is made up of his veterans from Italy. The other soldiers in his army are relatively recent recruits. Uh, they are not as well trained, they are not as experienced uh, as his veterans. And he is unable, apparently, to mold them into a cohesive whole like he had with his old army that had been in Italy. A year after his return, Hannibal led his men on a five-day march to the North African city of Zama. With the fate of Carthage hanging in the balance, Hannibal sent a message to Scipio calling for a meeting. Scipio accepted. Livy later wrote, they were not only the two greatest soldiers of their time, 
but the equals of any king or commander in the whole history of the world. For a minute, mutual admiration struck them dumb, and they looked at each other in silence. Hannibal was first to speak. If fate has decreed that I, who was aggressor in the war with Rome, and so many times have had victory almost within my grasp, should of my own will come to ask for peace, I rejoice at least that destiny has given me you and no other from whom to ask it. Hannibal reminded Scipio of the power of fortune. He reminded Scipio that he, Hannibal, had been in a position just a few years before to force peace upon Rome that he had been the, in the leading position and asked Scipio to remember that you could never trust fortune, that the terms of peace were enough, that Carthage was defeated. There was no need to carry the war any further. But Scipio rejected Hannibal's plea for peace. As for myself, I am aware of human infirmity. I do not ignore the might of fortune, and I know well that all we do is subject to a thousand chances. He wanted the glory of victory for himself. He wanted the glory of a crowning victory over Hannibal in person to bring an end to this war. Scipio claimed that the Carthaginians were faithless so that he was saying to Hannibal, no, we have to defeat you completely because we cannot trust you. Unable to come to terms, the two generals returned to prepare their men for war. With the Numidians now allied with Rome, Hannibal faced a cavalry superior to his own for the first time in his life. If he were to emerge victorious at Zama, he must depend upon the power of his elephants. At the Battle of Zama, Hannibal sets up his men in three lines, supported by elephants. He now has 80 elephants. For the first time, he's got a large number of elephants uh, in one of these battles. So these he puts right out in front, and the idea is send these forward, disorder the Roman line, create chaos, and then come in with the rest of the army to follow up the attack. That's the idea. The problem is the Romans are ready for this. Scipio had lined up his men to create separate channels, essentially, which allow the elephants to go through. Usually the elephants are not going to trample on people uh, unless they have no choice. And so the elephants run through the lines of Scipio and have no further effect really on the battle. Both sides place their cavalries on their wings with three lines of troops in the middle. Hannibal positioned his less experienced men in the first two lines hoping to wear down the Romans. He would save his battle-tested veterans for his final assault. The cavalry of the Romans attacks the cavalry of the Carthaginians, and the Carthaginian cavalry is driven from the field. Now this either happens because, well, they are overwhelmed and are forced to flee, or because this is part of Hannibal's strategy. They may have wanted to drag the Roman cavalry off the battlefield and hope that these guys would chase the Carthaginians and would not be a factor in the battle itself. With their cavalries engaged in heavy fighting on the wings, Hannibal and Scipio sent their massive armies out to meet one another. This is where the battle will be decided. And as Scipio's men come towards the Carthaginians, again showing their new abilities that Scipio has drilled into them in Spain and afterwards, the three lines suddenly form into one continuous line with which to face the Carthaginians. And then the two lines come together. The Roman army, the main infantry in the center, advance, engage Hannibal's first line, and cut through it fairly quickly. That first line of Roman troops is then able to go on and beat the second Carthaginian line without having to call on significant numbers of the second or third lines of the Roman army. Now all that lay between the Romans and victory were Hannibal's veteran soldiers. The same men who routed the Romans at Cannae 14 years earlier. The time to settle old scores had arrived. The battle goes on long enough for Scipio's cavalry to return from their pursuit to come in behind Hannibal's infantry, do to them what Hannibal had done to the Romans at Cannae, and then it's all over. the 
end of the day, more than 20,000 Carthaginians lay dead on the battlefield. Nearly as many were taken prisoner. From that day forward, in honor of having defeated the great Hannibal in North Africa, Scipio would forever be known as Scipio Africanus, the first Roman general ever to be named for the people he conquered. For Hannibal, surrender was the only option. Carthage accepted the terms demanded by Scipio. She would give up her claim to all the lands occupied by Rome, surrender her elephants and what was left of her fleet, recognize the rights of Rome's new allies in Africa, and pay Rome reparations for the war. The terms were not as harsh as they might have been, but Scipio lacked the manpower and time to destroy Carthage outright. After the Battle of Zama, Scipio was faced with the fact that his command was about to come up. He wanted the glory both of having defeated Hannibal and of having brought the war to an end. So if he didn't make terms very quickly with Carthage, then his successor would be the one responsible for the peace. Out of respect for his opponent, the victorious consul allowed Hannibal to go free. If you brought Hannibal back as a captive and strangled him in the Tullianum the way you might do another defeated leader, the myth of Hannibal would be gone with Hannibal. He would not be this great evil genius who Rome had confronted and Rome had defeated. Not seeing Hannibal made him all the more potent a myth in the Roman imagination. Hannibal returned home to Carthage. The last chapter of his life was about to be written. And much to the surprise of the Romans, the great general would rise yet again. With the end of the Second Punic War in 201 BC, Hannibal returned to Carthage. Five years after his homecoming, the weary soldier exchanged warfare for politics and was elected chief magistrate. When he comes back into Carthage, people were clearly willing to make some space for him. They clearly respected his accomplishments. Uh, they saw him as a leader. Hannibal was plainly an extraordinarily intelligent man, uh, a man who could inspire great loyalty from people around him. Hannibal shifted his focus from winning wars to ridding Carthage of political corruption. He enacted numerous reforms, and within a few years, the war-torn country paid the first installment of the huge indemnity owed to Rome. According to Livy, this payment caused much weeping in the Senate at Carthage. Hannibal allegedly laughed while his countrymen wept. Rebuked by a senator, Hannibal lashed out. If eyes could see the mind within as they do the expression of a face, it would soon be apparent to you that this laughter you condemn springs not from a happy heart, but from one which is almost beside itself with misfortunes. The time to weep was when our arms were taken from us, our ships were burnt, and we were forbidden foreign wars. That was when we received our death blow. You have no reason to believe that the Romans had any interest in your domestic peace, for domestic peace can never stay for long in a great country. The same political enemies who clashed with Hannibal in the Senate would soon betray him to the Romans. They send their couriers to Rome and start spreading rumors about Hannibal's renewed intentions to fight against the Romans. How he will once again become their most feared enemy. And the Romans have to do something about it. Carthage resurgent is bad enough. Carthage resurgent with Hannibal there is terrifying. When Hannibal received word that Rome had dispatched two envoys to arrest him, he fled Carthage, never to return. 
He sought refuge in Syria, where King Antiochus was locked in his own war with the Romans. Antiochus wasted little time naming Hannibal his chief military advisor and commander of the navy. The requirements of naval warfare were completely at odds with the Hannibal who controlled the psychology of generals against whom he was fighting, who would choose his own grounds for battle very skillfully. In naval warfare, your ground was chosen for you. All that was Hannibal was lost in Hannibal the Admiral. The Romans soundly defeated Antiochus and demanded that Hannibal be turned over to them. Again, he fled. He would live the rest of his life on the run. Once they do start to chase Hannibal down, then they're not going to stop. The Romans are terrified that Hannibal, this man who hates them so much, this genius of a commander, is going to come back at them with somebody else's army. The Romans finally caught up with Hannibal in 183 BC at the court of King Prusius of Bithynia. With Roman soldiers closing in, Hannibal realized too late that he'd been betrayed by the king. This time, there would be no escape. His last hours were spent in his bedchamber. It was there that he mixed the poison that would take his life. Let us ease the Romans of their continual dread and care who think it long and tedious to await the death of a hated old man. Like his father Hamilcar, Hannibal had chosen suicide rather than dishonor at the hands of his enemy, denying the Romans their ultimate victory. Hannibal had, I think, a great sense of himself. He was not going to allow himself to be humiliated at the end of his life. And he was, at that point, a very old man. He was in his 60s uh, at the time that the Romans came for him in the court of King Prusius. And he wanted to die with his honor intact. months of the great general's death, his longtime foe Scipio Africanus passed away in Italy. It really was the end of a generation when the two of them left the world at roughly the same time. The real living presence of the Second Punic War died with them. Carthage fought a third and final Punic War that ended with the complete destruction of Carthage in 146 BC. In the end, Carthage was broken into and destroyed and set fire. And there's a story that's current among modern historians, though I fear not in any ancient text, that the Romans sowed the ruins of Carthage with salt so that nothing could grow there ever again. With its greatest enemy destroyed, Rome grew from an Italian city-state into a colossal empire that would dominate the world for the next 500 years. Reduced to ruins, Carthage and its history were lost forever. But the vanquished empire's greatest general lived on in the writings of Roman historians. Livy and others painted a portrait of Hannibal far different from the man who had given fallen Roman officers proper military funerals and who had rid his own government of corruption. They portrayed the Carthaginian as a cruel and greedy tyrant who was godless and built bridges made of dead Roman soldiers. Is he an honorable man? Is he a horrible man? The real Hannibal is somewhere lost in these images. I think Hannibal's most extraordinary qualities are his intelligence, resourcefulness, courage, determination. He may be driven by hatred as well, 
Is he a Carthaginian hero or is he somebody who is driven purely by desire for revenge? Certainly that's what the Romans would like us to think. They don't like him. Occasionally there's a grudging admiration for him, but they don't tell us anything nearly as much as we'd like. Hannibal we perhaps remember in part because of the epic nature of some of his achievements, you know, taking elephants across the Alps and these massive victories that he won. Perhaps there's also that element of romanticism that often comes associated with someone who does all these things but loses in the end, like Napoleon, like Caesar. A man's heart may well long for victory rather than for peace. I better understand the aspiring spirit than the politic brain. And once on me too smiled such fortune as is yours. Nonetheless, if in prosperity the gods also gave us wisdom, we should consider not only what has happened in the past, but what might happen in the future. To ignore all else, I alone am sufficient warning of what fate may bring. The earth is quiet for now. We've been hit before, and there's more out there. An asteroid rocking this planet? Imminent. If a super tornado were to hit downtown Dallas? Forget if. It's more like when. Mega disasters. Premieres Tuesday night at 9 on the History Channel.